This episode of the podcast is sponsored by Dr. Alan Jacob. If anyone has any questions, comments, or feedback, or would like to sponsor an episode of the podcast, please email me, sfarmchatter at gmail.com. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Sfarim Chatter podcast. On this episode of the podcast, I'm going to be joined by Professor Jeffrey Wolf, who is an associate professor in the Talmud Department at bar University. And we will be discussing the Marek, Rabbi Yosef Colon Triboto, if I got the pronunciation right, uh, which Professor Wolf um, wrote his dissertation on a while back, and he is working on a book now on, on him. So uh, obviously one of the most um, uh, you know, important and impactful place uh throughout the century. So thank you, Professor Wolf, for joining me. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. So let's start off. Tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and your background. Okay. Um, I'm Boston-born. Did my BA at, uh, I did two BAs actually, at uh, Boston University and at Boston Hebrew College. I did my MA and PhD at Harvard. Uh, during that time, I started studying with uh, Reb Soloveitchik Zatzal, whom I followed to New York and got smich from him in 19, 1982. So Sacha Kol, nine years, nine and a half years with him. Um, and it was on a, uh, actually on my, on my honeymoon um, that uh, I met uh, the person who would be my second uh mentor, I guess, in, in Jewish history, Professor uh, Roberto Bruvain Bonfield, who suggested uh, who suggested that I tell so I write about the uh, about Rabbi Joseph Colon, Troboto. Uh, Professor Tversky, who was my major mentor in so many, so many things, not just in academia, um, but under whom I wrote my doctorate at Harvard, uh, was very enthused, among other reasons, because uh, one of the major contributions that the Marik uh, made to um, to Jewish scholarship mm -hmm. and to Torah scholarship uh, is in the study of the Rambam. If you go through very carefully the Kesef Mishnah, Rabbi Yosef Karo's commentary on the Mishnah Torah, the Marik pops up in all kinds of uh, in all kinds of central places, and there are a number of places where, um, by implication uh, or, in ex or expressly uh, stated, um, uh, Rabbi Yosef Karo assumes that the uh, Marik has provided us with. Uh, with the open, with the straightforward uh, meaning of, a, of difficult Rambams. Um, anyways, I finished my doctorate in 1991, and uh, it's been two years at Yale. And in 1993, we I was appointed, I received an appointment to Barilan University, and uh, we met Aliyah. We've been here ever since, and never looked back. Okay, sounds good. So you mentioned there about the Marek in, in, in the Casa Mission, and we'll get into how you know how important the Marek has been for halacha. Um, and then we say Ramon and all and all that. So I think, but the thing is, I mean, I, I think I can say this that that people probably don't know much about the Marik today, especially not uh, his personal life story and where he lived and, and and much about that. So I think that's a good uh, place to start. Is you know just give a basic background. I mean, where where was he from? I mean, and and talk about his name. You know, obviously people know him as the Marik, but he's of Cologne. But like you say, that's not that's not is not not from the city of Cologne. Sure. Okay. So uh, let's start. Let's put him into context. Uh, Rabbi Joseph Colon, the son of Rabbi Shlomo Tra Solomon Traboto, was born apparently in 1420 or thereabouts, and he died either in 1480 or 1484. There were some some differences. The best bets are that he was born in uh, the, in the city of Chambéry. Chambéry is the capital of the then Duchy of Savoy. Today, it's a uh, department of uh, of, uh, kind of, of France, but at the time, it was an independent duchy. Uh, under the suzerainty, under the overall rule of the German Empire, French-speaking, and that's important because uh, Marik was, Maharik, by the way, stands for Ma'alat HaRav Rabbeinu Yosef Kolon, uh, our master, uh, our master Joseph Kolon, it's just easier. But I'd rather say Maharik than say Kolon, which is the way that uh, academics would refer to him. Anyways, um, he um, was, it's important to know where he was born and where he came from because he represented a unique uh, sub-tradition within Ashkenazic Jewry, um, the French tradition. There are, um, although we know about Ashkenazim and Sephardim, or Ashkenazim is Mizrahim, as it's more, pro more appropriate uh, to say today, but fewer people are aware of the fact that, despite the fact that they had a tremendous amount in common, the Jews who um, came from France had a very, very different halachic and uh, costumal and even derech halimut than in fact uh, German rabbis did. Again, there's a lot of back and forth between the two. Um, a person who's written about this for the uh, earlier medieval period uh, is of course Professor uh, Ephraim Canterfolk, but this distinction between the two communities continues uh, 
all the way down to 17th century. And the two worlds didn't always get along. That's the minute, right? <laughs> Not to get along. For our purposes, for example, French Jews had their own, um, they had their own Nusatvila, their own liturgy, um, some of which continued to exist until, until World War II. Uh, there were two. There were three cities in northwestern Italy in the area called the Piedmont of Piemonte. Uh, the three cities of Asti, Asti, Fontesposano, and Moncalvo, which um, continued to uh, use for the Yom and Norayim a special marzer, which was called Marzer Afam, which stood for Asti, Fosano, Moncalvo, which reflected the piutim and the minhagim and the music and everything else of the uh, of the ancient French tradition, which goes back to Rashi, it, I mean, or in, and before. French Jews who moved elsewhere to move to Spain and moved into Germany proper, they ended up being swallowed up, by the, becoming Ashkenazified and, and basically lost their identity. But those who came, those who went into Savoy and from Savoy into Italy, uh, maintained a separate identity for uh, hundreds of years afterwards. And and Marik was very much, saw himself as the representative of this unique uh, tradition. In in general, I would argue, I, I point out, that in terms of, for example, Dera Halimud, in terms of the way that they studied, um, if you look at the Chuvot of the Marik and of his students, many of whom were his relatives, his life, if you look at the, uh, if you look at the name Traboto in general, in, uh, in the various catalogs, you find there's all kinds of tributo there because he, he was a very large family. Um, the um, the French Jews had a tendency to have much more lundus, much more pill pull, not in the bad sense, but pill pull in the in the you know in, in the analytic sharpness type of uh, uh, type of sense. But they were much more analytic than uh, than the Germans. The German Jews, the German rabbis were very. It says this. It says this. It says this. It says this. There's a little bit of back and forth, but generally, there's a lot of there's a lot of just quoting um, that go that uh, that goes on there. Uh, very di very different style in terms of learning. Also, interestingly, um, French Jews were not affected by Hasidic Ashkenaz. In other words, this very clear tendency actually starts with Myron Rutenberg. Uh, to be machmir, uh, to be yotzel cholodeis, not to really want um, to make decisions among among earlier poskim, because for obvious reasons, you know, you're so you're raw, you don't feel you feel inadequate, and so on. Or in general, a general trend tendency to um, to be machmir, or or the whole idea of um, of tikkun tshuva, of uh, ascetic uh, practices for it's all, all very appropriate this time of year. Uh, ascetic practices, which were very common among German Jews as a result of the German Pietists. French knew nothing about it. Gornish mit Gornish. They weren't into it. Uh, in fact, there's a wonderful, uh, Marik, among other things, wrote a parish or dictated a parish on Chumash. And uh, on one occasion, he addresses the question of what kapara, what penance should you take, yourself, take upon yourself for whatever certain sin was, when German rabbis like the Trumas Adeshin and others would say you have to go into Golos and you have to roll around in the snow and you have to go and all kinds of stuff. So the Marik quotes the Gemara in Shabbos. The Gemara says in Shabbos that uh, Rabbi Yishmael, um was once sitting by on Friday night and he was sitting by an oil lamp and he by accident touched the uh, touched the oil lamp to increase the flame and you know obviously by mistake. And Rabbi Shmuel's attitude was answer was. You know what? When the base of Mikdash is, 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 is rebuilt, I'm going to bring a big fat chattis. I mean, avi, avi chattach meina. Which is sort of a saying to say, look at I made it. I didn't have Vera. I'm sorry. I'll do, you know, I'll do tshuva, whatever. But I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to go jump naked into, into ice water, which is what the Hasidi Ashkenaz and those that followed them uh, did. So that, that's, so they so have a very, so the French, this French branch was much more sharp. You know, I, I, you know, I have, I'm showing my own prejudices. Being a Bostonian, uh, who's a descendant, uh, who's a scion of a Litvisha family that made that came in the first Aliyah Israel and then were thrown out and came to Boston. So the Litvak, he was more of a Litvak. So uh, he was born in 1420. His father was, was a major Rav, Shlomo Sreit Shabbato. We have some tshuvas from him, some uh, apparently involved, some involvement in Kabbalah as well. There were a large number of, um, large number of rabbis uh, from uh, French and some German uh, rabbis in uh, in the area. And uh, apparently when he was around 20, 25, he moved into, um, moved over to the Alps into what is called the Piedmont, the uh, foot of the mountains of Pied Piemonte, which attracted a lot of French Jews. Um, he was running from and running to. He was running from because 
the uh, the Duchy of Savoy per se uh, began to become uh, increasingly hostile towards Jews. And number two, a pattern began to open up of economic opportunity for Jews in what is today Italy. Italy, of course, didn't exist until the Risorgimento of the 19th century, Garibaldi and the unification of Italy. Italy was um, divided into city-states, which uh, were slowly but surely swallowed up by other, uh, by bigger city-states. Um, but when, we, there were certain trends that, have, were, that were true of the entire area. And one of them was that the northern part of Italy from Rome northward uh, began to undergo an economic uh, boom. And there was a tremendous need for credit. That's a fancy way of saying people needed loans. And um, there were two types of loans. There were the kinds of big heavy duty loans that were carried, handled by the Medici who would loan to kings and dukes and, and popes and all whatever. And then the average person, the average uh, middle-class uh, middle uh, person or, or the, uh, the farmer who needs money to be able to buy, to buy seed and so on. And into that niche, um, Jews came uh, very, uh, were very, de were a desirable quantity because usury, meaning, but usury just means um, paying for the use of money. Um, usury was a, is considered to be in Catholicism, or at least was until the 15th, 16th century, a, a, uh, a mortal sin. And the idea was, but it's a forbidden to Jews as well. But the thing is that the idea is, well, look, the Jews are going to go to hell anyways. So, you know, what's the point? I mean, so we, so Jews were invited in. Jews had portable wealth. They had, um, they had a certain amount of cash with them. Where that cash came from is another, another story. And um, so there was great desire for them to, to invite them. So, the, so Jews started moving into Italy and, and Marik went along with that. Most of his life, he made a living as a teacher, as a Rebbe. He may have been actually supported by wealthy people who wanted a big Talmud Chacham in their home. And they would bring and they would support students because if you were a if you're a um, you know like it's like sitting on the board of YU today right you sit on the board of YU give a certain amount of money and they give you a lot of comments at the time there was no YU no big the idea of a big yeshiva with a board didn't exist until the 19th century so what you did was you had a rav who came and gave sure him first of all teach your children. And he would say, and he would live in your house. And uh, the fact that you were hosting so and so and so, so that was considered to be a mark of uh, prestige. And if you had legal problems, you could consult him in terms as a sort of something of an in house, uh, you know, at council in your um, in your home. So he moved in in the 1440s or 1450s, moved into the city of Sevillano, which still has a uh, later built shul in uh, in uh, in the Piedmont. He lived there and he had a yeshiva there. He drew students from all over Italy. Uh, most of them were also French like him. Uh, a chunk of them were his, were his relatives. And um, he stayed there for about, let's say 15 years. And then he started wondering why he wanted, I, to this day, I'm not sure why. Uh, he ended up moving to um, the Veneto, really, which is the other side of Italy. I mean, we're talking about the, from the West Coast to the East Coast. Uh, Jews were not allowed to live in Venice at the time. He spent some time in uh, the city of Mistre, where he encountered German Jews, Jews who had been um, driven out of Germany or had run away from the never-ending uh, pogroms. I'm using the word pogrom anachronistically, but never-ending persecutions of Jews in Germany. They would come over the Alps the other way and settled in the eastern part of northern Italy. Uh, there are many people who think that Yiddish actually originated in Italy and not in Poland, but I don't want to take a stand on that because it gets very, uh, among the scholars of Yiddish, it gets, a very touchy, it, gets to be, it gets to be a very touchy thing. He... Um, he lives in the city of Mestre, which is also a place where a, a lot of a large gathering of uh, Jewish uh, of, of major scholars, and then he goes to around 1467, approximately. Uh, he moves to the city 1468. He moves to the city of Mantova. Now Mantova, which is not that far, uh, it's another city state. It was under the Gonzaga. The Gonzaga were famous for being very, very open to Jews. Uh, very tolerant. Whenever the church would say you're treating the Jews too well, they would say, do me something. He moved to uh, to uh, Mantova, apparently either he taught, there is some evidence maybe he was also in involved in uh, loan banking. 
that's another fancy way of saying being a loan, being a being a money lender. And at, uh, at during this time in Mantova, he is uh, his reputation really uh, takes off. One of the reasons for that is the fact that uh, a few years earlier, in 1460, the overwhelmingly dominant posek of the time, Rabbi Yisrael Isserlein, the Trumas Edeshin, uh had died. And so there's a vacuum. The only other Rav who could come close to him, Rabbi Yudemitz, was in Padova. And, and for reasons that we'll see, um, he, Marik became the posek of choice, not only for French Jews, uh, but for Italian Jews who came from from a really Italian uh, Italian background, some of his most famous chuvas are written at this uh, are written at this time. He also gets himself involved in all kinds of arguments around this time with other rabbis. One of the great menhagim of Italian Jewry is to have big fights among rabbis. I know that doesn't happen anymore, but you know, this is something that happened in the Middle Ages. And um, one of the fights he gets involved with is actually somebody he helped earlier, and that's and that person's name was Rabbi Yehuda ben Yechiel Messer Leon, who's a trip by himself. Anyways, Maharik gets in a fight with this um, uh, Yehuda ben Yechiel Messer Leon, who had been knighted, by the way, Messer means like sir. And um, the fight apparently got to be so bad that they were, according to one report, they were both tossed out of Mantua. It's probably about 1471, 1472. Uh, by 1473, he has uh, moved to makes his final move to Pavia. Pavia is the is a mate was the is a traditional the traditional capital of the Italian kingdom. It was under the Duchy of Milan, and uh, he spends apparently the last seven years of his life in Pavia. Even here, he doesn't he doesn't avoid uh, controversy. He sucked into a an intra Jewish war in Istanbul of all places in 1453. Uh, the Byzantine Empire was conquered by the Ottomans. Constantinople becomes Istanbul, which, by the way, only means in the city. It's one of these interesting things, like like New York is say in the city. You don't say New York, right? So they never really that for them that was the only city. In any event, there were four Jewish communities in Istanbul, major Jewish communities. This is even before the Spartan get the Spanish and the Spanish Jews get expelled uh, forty years later, and uh, 1492, and um, they have a chief rabbi, a Chacham Bashi. Who some of them don't like. So what they do is they turn to Marik and they make up a whole bill of goods about the chief rabbi whose name is Rabbi Moshe Kapsali. And Marik believes them. And he sends off a broad, a broadside of Shuvas screaming that this guy should be deposed. He's an ignorant, he's ignorant, he's an idiot. Truth is, he was a big time of Moshe Kapsali. And um, and this and this becomes a world war. And then in 1479, somebody comes to my Rick and Puppy and says, "You know, you've been had because none of this happened. None of the piske halacha which which they told you Moshe Kapsali made were ever given." And my Rick felt terrible, and he did something which is, um, it's I listen, my Marbana maybe it is, but it's something which we don't do enough in our contemporary political. Culture, he took responsibility. He said, "I did something really terrible," and he sent his son Peretz, who was making aliyah anyways. There were many ways to actually travel to Israel in those days, and usually you would leave. You would leave. You would leave. You would either go south and leave from Benevento or uh, Southern Port, the way that Rabbi Vadimir Bartanura, who was a student of Myrick, uh, did when he made aliyah in 1488. Uh, you could go from Venice directly to uh, Eretz Israel without stopping, or you'd stop in Cyprus. He said he's tell, he told his son Peretz, "You have to go via Istanbul, and you have to beg forgiveness of Rabbi Moshe Kapsali for the wrong that I have done to him." Uh, he died, um, Marik, but uh, we know the Rabbi Peretz went mm -hmm. straight to uh, Istanbul and, and asked forgiveness, and they were reconciled. And Ben Peretz went on on to uh, to Yerushalayim and one branch of the family um, um, who settled in Eretz Israel and in Svat and in Yerushalayim. Uh, Marik has, I, I did not know this. I mean, I did, it was not clear to me how many, there are a lot of, the Cologne name, his, his original last name was Trabota, but apparently later on they took Cologne, which was his second English, English name, uh, you know, whatever, non-Jewish name, uh, and made it a last name. Um, there's a lot of colognes floating around in Italy uh, who may be descendants, but I was recently, recently, a number of years ago, approached by somebody, um, I think from Philadelphia, whose, whose last name was Mogarik. 
and said that he was a descend, direct descendant of Rabbi Moshe, uh, Rabbi Yosef Kolon. It's really intriguing. How does he get a name Mugarik? Because you take Maharik, and then you move to Russia. And in Russia, there is no H. There's only a G. Like, for example, a person's name is Gurevich, is really Horowitz, but they don't say G. They don't say H. So a person named Mogarik is Maharik, except that in Russia, that's how you pronounce it in Russian. That's why, by the way, the, the why, why, what would the, the Chavetz Chaim's last name officially was Kagan. He was Kohen. But Kagan is how you say Kohen when you want to say it in Russian. Anyways, so that's basically his, um, his biography. Um, I can tell you, if you want to put it into context, just, just whatever, um, Marik was an exact contemporary of Lorenzo the Magnificent, Medici. He's an older contemporary of Michelangelo. He's an exact contemporary of Leonardo da Vinci. Um, he's an exact contemporary of Tzachak Apolhaf, who was the really leading uh, post in Spain at the time. He's an exact contemporary also of Rabbi Yosef Pollock. Joseph Pollock, you recall, you may recall, is the person who really established Pilpul in the yeshivas in Poland. He lives. The part of the importance of the Myrick is the fact that he's one of these transitional figures. There are, there, there is this period. For, it's actually, of course, I'm giving this here at Barilan. There's a period of 200 years between around 1300 or 1320, and 1500, which is underappreciated, unknown, and it, and Chaval that that's the case because. Ashkenazic tradition, the way we know it, was created then. Um, the end of the, the end of the classic days of Ashkenaz is by Rutenberg, who dies in 1293. And everybody knows about the about the Ramah and the Marshal and, and the Bach and then the Shah. But something happened in the meantime. The Jews got from Western Europe to Eastern Europe, and a lot of things were transformed. Uh, I mean, I remember I learned about this way before I decided this was my, my doctoral thesis. Um, when I first learned for Smicha, uh, I, got, I, I, I got Smicha first from Rabbi Gedalia Felder Zetzal, who was chief rabbi of Toronto, who was a post like, because I knew, because I needed, I, I went to Shimush and Halacha Lamaisa, and, and brisker Svaras don't help really when you have to Paskin Svaras, Paskin Shilas. Um, and um, so what he had me do, I remember, was I uh, do a lot of you know, you do, you do all this, all the relevant figures for all of Taru, all of, you know, whatever it is, the Shita, the Malicha, the Zukal, the Taru, whatever. And then, Machabra Moshach Taz. So I think that'll be easy. That's a sin. So I'll go through everything. I'll go all the way up to the Rosh. And then, you know, and then I'll just, you know, it, and the Macha, and then the Shulchan Aruch will be reviewed. Then I found, then, you, I mean, anybody who has ever done this knows that you leave all the sugis and all the svaras and everything else, and you're fine, and then you look at the Shulchan Aruch and you go, what is going on here? This has absolutely nothing to do <laughs> with what I've been doing for the past six months. What happened, What ha the transformation happened in this 150, 200 years that we're talking about, when um, when Ashkenaz moved from, uh, from, from west to east. And Marik is a major, 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 I, I, you know what, let's do it this way. If you look in the Chuvas of the Ramad, there were two, I mean, yes, there's a lot of people there you know, from this period, but there were two people who really are predominant. One is the Truman Sedeshan, Rabbi Israel Isserloin, and the other one is the Marik. They are the two conduits by which classical Ashkenaz is transferred and transformed on the way to becoming Poland. So I just want to get back to his name for a second. So he's known as Marik, obviously, which is interesting. So because of Cologne, although, as you mentioned, that wasn't his actually his last name. And also, people probably know the city of Cologne. That's not where it comes from. So where does his name Cologne come from? And, and, and why, I guess, was, also, do you know why he became known as that if that wasn't his last name? Um, I look at people had, in, 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 it wasn't just in Italy. This is the period when people get, end up getting a lot of double names. You get, for example, among Germans, you get a lot of um, German versions of English of, Hebrew, of, uh, of of your Hebrew name, like Yitzhak Isaac, and uh, or the translations is Dover. This type of stuff happens uh, in Italy, um, or anyway, they, they in France. You begin to get um, second names that uh, are the ones that you use for official documents. So, for example, uh, he was Harav Yosef, but he was Cologne. Cologne is Columbus, means it means a dove. Um, that's how he's referred to. In the there was two, uh, there were a few places where he's mentioned by his by his Latin name. Uh, in one of them, it's actually when he was in Pavia, he apparently had his yeshiva living in his house with him, uh, or Talmidim. And there is a police report uh, on the docket, uh, police blotter, is that what it's called, 
uh, was reported to the Podesta. The Podesta was the chief legal, uh, uh, the chief of police, let's call it, chief of police in uh, Pavia, that there was an altercation among students uh, in the house of Magister Colombo. And they called the police. And uh, when the police came, everybody said, no, nothing happened. But because uh, you're not, you don't want to be a moisture, right? So, um, but that apparently was where, uh, where that's, so that for we, but we know from that, that that's where he was, uh, that that's how he was known as Magister Colombo. You have, um, uh, you have a lot of translations of, um, of Hebrew names of rabbi, of serious, of significant rabbis that pop up. But sometimes they're translations, sometimes they're not. Uh, Rabbi Chimi Paris uh, is known as Magister Vivo. Vivo, Chai, Yechiel, same, it's the same word, same word. On the other hand, go no, I mean, I have a, there's a new book about the Ramban, which just came out. Uh, from what I can see, it's an excellent book by uh, Professor Oded Yisraeli at um, Ben Gurion. Um, he's a professor, he's also Talmud Chacham. Anyways, the Ramban was Banastrik de la Porta, go no. I, I mean, that's got nothing to Moshe ben Nachman and Banastrik de la Porta. Banastrik de la Porta means Mazel Tov min Hashar. So gay, so gay base, what, what, <laughs> why, why he got tagged with a name like that? Uh, in general, names, uh, usually there's a lot, it's, he, that's, he was French, but among the Italians, for example, there's a lot more Lundus when they, when they go looking for, uh, to give a non-Jewish name, because you need to, because you have to register with the, uh, with the authorities. So for example, uh, my favorite example, there's a machlokas between, uh, there's two days in Chazal, the Medrash, as to who was Malachi. So 99% eh, of the people say it was Ezra. But there was one day among Chazal that, uh, that, uh, that, um, that Malachi was Mordechai. And in, among Italian Jews, if your name was Mordechai, then your, your Italian name was Angelo. Nine times out of ten, if it's a guy's name is Angelo, then his Hebrew name is Mordechai. Sometimes it's just translations. A guy's name is Do Yoab, so you name Deodata, which means God gives. That's all I can say. There is a Yona family in Spain, but I've never been able to find any connection. With it. But names are also fluid. So they decided not to go Trabota, they said Colon, okay, you know, maybe they called him by his two names and then that stuck. I mean, you can never, until relatively recently, there's no go no. The Rabbi Sulchanan's last name was Specter, and his son's name was Robinovich. I mean, I understand because his father was La Rav, but you know that's about as good okay. as I can make. Yeah, you know, listen, we don't have to go. Uh, that, 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 that's that's perfect. So let's get back I and mean, we give a very nice overview. Now we can drill down a little deeper on some of these uh, things that you mentioned. So I think the first thing really uh, that you mentioned is the is the Shiva in, in, in Mantua. So first of all, I don't know. You can mention here already. I mean, you, you threw out the Raja Bartanura as being one of his Talmidim. Um, and you, you mentioned also Raja Bartanura famously, he went to Eretz Yisrael and he has, there's letters that he wrote. That's what we know about Eretz Yisrael from that time period in the 15th century. He wrote letters back to his father in Italy. For me, that becomes a very important thing because uh, not just per se, I mean, we all read the Rav, we learned the Rav with the Ravi Bartanura, but the cemetery in Pavia, the Jewish cemetery in Pavia was destroyed uh, in the course of a war which uh, took place in 1509 called the War of the League of, Chamb of Cambrai. And... Um, and so there's no there's no there's no cemetery to to visit if, when I go to Italy, but I can when I when I when I have a Marik moment, so I can get in the car and I can drive to the I, the, the Rabbi Bartnur is is buried at the bottom of Harazesim, so I can just get in the car, drive over around Silwan, and and if I want to have some kind of physical connection with somebody who who had what to do with the Marik, so that that gives me an opp that opportunity. So besides for him, I mean, who are other Talmidim um, learned learned by the Marek? Um, I don't think any any names that are gonna they're gonna that are gonna ring because most of them were French. Um, there was uh, Azriel Azriel Trabot of uh, uh, he had two cousins Azriel Trabot that he that he studied that he taught. He had a student called Ben Sion de Noir, who wrote a manuscript on actually in Yerida type stuff. His impact was achieved in two by two things. It was achieved by his reputation in his life because he was. His opinion was sought by literally hundreds of uh, lay people and rabbis around the world, including from Germany, when uh, they when they needed an authority, when they needed an outstanding uh, Talmud Chacham or Posek to turn to in Germany and everybody else and, and all the local rabbis felt that they were taking sides, they would turn to him. There were a lot of uh, appeals to him from Nuremberg and Würzburg. One of the, the first Chuvin in his, his collection is, is from Würzburg. So that's one thing. The other thing is his book. His book became a bestseller. 
it was for his collection of tributes. Not all of them were published at the same time, but his first uh, it was for it was uh, the first issue was published in Venice by Daniel Barberg in 1519, uh, and it was so well thought of um, that one Egyptian rabbi, his name was Yechiel Ashkenazi, who lived a generation and a half later, said, "I don't have to quote the Ma'arik. Every rabbi who respects himself has a copy in his library." And by the way, if, if, if we have books in our libraries, which maybe we opened, maybe we didn't open. But when he says he has a library, it means people were, people were really learning uh, the Chuvot very, um, very extensively. So that's really where he made his mark. In addition, um, in addition, in an early indication of, as to his, his, his stature uh, as a post-sec, I think, is, um, is in Bomberg's business decision. Daniel Barber was a goy. In 1519, was in the middle of publishing the full first full shas. And he took out time to publish this set of chuvas. I have no, there was no doubt in my mind that the reason he did it was he needed money to finance the publication of the shas. And he figured this is going to be a quick bestseller, which will bring in money to be able to pay for the larger project. So that already tells you, you know, Whatever, but in addition, there are literally dozens of manuscripts of uh, of the chuvots. And to a to a certain degree, there are overlaps. Um, there are chuvot that were later connected collected by uh, by Eliyahu David Adolf Pines in a Shutut Piske Marika Chadashim, which uh, were published by 1980 and then Maria Shut 1984 by Machon Yerushalayim. Um, an indication of his uh, of, of of how popular his chuvas were, the fact that people put out little booklets with his piske halach. In other words, you don't they, the, even people that didn't have time to, or the ability to go through all chuvas, they have these little books in which you say, "What did the Marik Paskin on this?" And that's what we do. There was I don't think I have them anymore. There was a little series like that about 35, 40 years ago. I think it's called piske halacha, in which somebody put together the chuvas of the Debrutzina Rav and Rav Meisha. On all kinds of issues, and people have them because you know. I guess some rabbis have to work fast. Uh, pull them off the shelf, and there it is. And that's what you have. If people are going to spend the time to do that, to go through, you know, long. He's very, very wordy. He's very, very uh, precise. Willing to go through all that to go through the, to the bottom line to create an index so that people can have readily available um, a person's uh, person's bottom line. That's that. That's a incredible testimony to their uh, to their authority and their cachet. Another was was Rabbi Eldo Medigo a, a, a Talmud of his? No. He was not a Talmud of his. He, oh, oh. Um, he, there is one Shuba in which he mentions Rabbi Eliyahu as somebody named Eliyahu del Medigo. Eliyahu del Medigo uh, was a uh, philosopher. He was, a, he was an Averroist. He was a very interesting guy. He was a person who was in touch actually with the great Christian humanists of the day. Uh, is it the same Eliyahu del Medigo? Maybe. If it is, then it would say a lot about Marik. It would say a lot about Del Medigo, because one of the things, one of the mistakes, maybe it's, let's call it a distortion, you know, and I feel, I'm feeling very uh, combative today. Um, one of the distortions which affects Jewish historiography and Jewish studies in general is the fact that if you find a person who is a scientist and he's this and he's with non-Jews, it can't be he's a religious Jew. He's got, it must be he's a skeptic. It can't be he spent time learning Gemara. It can't be that that was important to him, you know, because that would break the, that would hurt the, that would hurt the brand. Um, if it's really done medical, then it says that it, it, it says a lot that, you know, it's that he had a Shaila and he returned to Marik to, if, we, if he learned with Marik, even better. But this was something which was important to him. And it's important to it's important to realize that we're talking about a society where people were fundamentally loyal Jews, and what what the Torah is, how the Torah tells you to lead your life was part of their was part of their life, and this becomes something which you know which which becomes a shock for academics and maybe not academics who 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 can't can't seem to accommodate that kind of thing. Um, I remember uh, uh, I won't say who it was, but I remember once. Uh, talking to a colleague who was really a major student of the Haskalah. And one of that person's heroes was Shir, Shir Shmuel Shlomo Yehuda Rappaport. Um, until that person saw a picture of Shlomo Yehuda Rappaport, who was the son-in-law of the um, of the Ketzos, 
And if you, the only picture we have of him is with a shpadik and with the talis, and she, and the person couldn't deal with the fact that this is the same, the same bird, the same guy. Um, so, uh, so in any case, so so that so he so it's a combination of of, of his own personal stature and uh, and the um, and the books coming and the book coming out afterwards, and also something else. <laughs> there were certain issues, and this is I wanted to drill down. I really don't want not don't want to miss this one issue. Um, there are certain issues where he really set the tone, um, not just for Italy but for the world. And one of those issues um, was the status of minic, the status of custom. But now we all know that Ashkenazim have a tendency to be much more reverential and not less less critical of of, of custom, of received custom than Sephardim. Um, if you look at the Rambam, the Rambam, the Rambam in the second parak in uh, Ilkas Mamrim um, reflects, you know, standard sort of like. Gemara hierarchy, where when you have you start with things that are minatorah, the things that are biblical, and at the bottom of the list is things that are minhagim. So yeah, I mean minhagim are important, but if a minig clashes with anything else, they knock out the minig. Uh, the words minhag taut, an erroneous, uh, an erroneous custom, not strange to the ways of to the world of. Uh, of uh, Mizrahi or Sephardic Pesach. Ashkenazim are much more reverential. That's a whole nother discussion. Um, however, um, in Marik's case, his defense of Minhag took on a significance which has a tremendous contemporary import uh, and also, I think, contemporary import for us. Um, the, case, the the standard the best case okay uh, the most I think notable case uh, happened in 1467 1469 in Florence what happened was as follows the Jews of Florence were overwhelmingly Italiani Italiani meaning that they were the descendants of Jews who had uh, whose ancestors had come from um, from Eretz Israel already in the time of Judah the Maccabee, or afterwards to the Romans, uh, generally they had lived under um, in the southern part of the peninsula, and then as a result of all kinds of uh, persecutions and things, around twelve in the late twelve nineties and the early thirteen hundreds, they left and moved north, or Jews from Rome, and who ended up moving north again to seek their fortunes because of the economic possibilities that were op opportunities that were opening up in the north. And they had all kinds of uh, customs of their own, especially as far as Psak is concerned. On one of those issues, uh, they clashed headlong with the French rabbis that they hired to be their rebellion and to teach their children in, uh, in Florence. Uh, what happened was very quickly. There's a, the the Gemara talks about the Gemara in Kedushin and Daf Mem or Daf Mem Amalef. Discusses the status of civil note, which are engagement presents. Uh, from time immemorial, when the couple gets engaged, the chassan sends the bridegroom sends a present to the to the bride to the kala. And what happens? Well, then the question becomes: What happens if the shidduch doesn't work? Um, do those gifts constitute kedushin such that such that you would have to give the in order to terminate the relationship, you'd have to give again. So the Gemara goes back and forth, back and forth. There are three different uh, versions of how what the Gemara's bottom line is, which are which are referred to in sort of chotosis. If you take a look on the on the spot, deals with all three possibilities. The bottom line is that in twelve in the twelve in, sometime in the late thirteenth century, Rab Myram Rittenberg said, you know what, Asius Ish, the status of a woman, you don't know if she's kedushas or not. It's such a drake up, and you don't know what are you going to do. We we'll just be machmer. You should always be machmer. And, and just always require again. Now, the Rambam, who was the guiding light for Ashka, for, for Italian Jews from the late 13th century on, makes it very clear if a community is absolutely consistent in the fact that these engagement presents, these civil notes, are given way before there's any kind of condition or any kind of wedding, that they're just presents, you're turning the presents, call it. There's not a problem. Okay. And the Italian practice, in accordance with the Rambam, was that um, when a shidduch would break up, they would return the presents, and that was it. Came these French Jews uh, and saying, no, 
you have to be machmir. Mar Rutenberg says you have to be machmir. But the, what are the implications? The implications are that they're also fake mamzera, because this has been going on for hundreds of years. So they go to Marik, who's a French rub. He's the leading post, like in the leading French rub in, in, in Italy, 1469. He's already come into his own. What do you what do you say? So Marik says he's absolutely he's horrified by what his confreres have been saying. He said, no, the minig of a community is testimony to its probity. And he says, we so we, I said, I know Italian Jews. There are there are Tamidi Chachamim there, there are Frum Jews there. And if there had ever been a question that these gifts constitute Kedushin, it would have come up. You have to respect the absolute integrity of the community and their Menagim. He basically advocates, I don't like to use the word because it's abused from today till tomorrow, he advocates a position of halachic pluralism. And he explicitly quotes a Gemara in Chulin that Nara, Naru, Pashte, every single river has its own, um, has its own course. I mean, as long as, okay, I'm not saying every, it's not like to say the meaning, of, the meaning among Jews is to be Michal Shabbos. We're not, we're not talking about that. We're talking about a situation in which you have, you know, different rules. They, diff, you know, they, they work accordingly. You have to respect each one. Now, this became this sock of his, which is, he backs up in a, all kinds of other ways, all, all kinds of other places, other connections, becomes the, the lodestar of how do you deal with uh, communities uh, which are meeting. We're talking about a period in which Jews are already thrown out of France and they're on the move to Spain or they're on the move to Germany. The German Jews are moving into Poland. Everybody's moving around. And you have this, con it constantly comes up. And he, sa and he says explicitly, you have to respect every single community and don't call them into question. Now, maybe once they come move here, they may have to change their customs so we can all get along. Fine, but you don't ex post facto impose your chumras or your position on a community which maintains, has a tradition which is equally valid and equally respectable. Interestingly, if you take a look at the index, um, Rabbi, the late Rabbi Asher, Rabbi Professor Asher Siv, uh, put out an edition of the Chuvas of the Ramoshe Yisrael. If you look in the index to his um, indices, to his Chuvas, and you look under Marik, Marik was profoundly influential on the Ramah. Those Chuvas dealing with Minhagim are the most are the most often quoted, and you find that they're constantly invoked, especially by Italian Jew, by Italian rabbis, because this idea of I they call it halachic imperialism. This halachic imperialism keeps popping up, and the Italian Jews especially, the first halachic encyclopedia was called Pachat Yitzchak, was written at the end of the 17th century by Rabbi Yitzchak Lampronti from Ferrara. Um, he, uh, it, every five minutes on, on major issues, on this, uh, whenever it comes up, whenever the issue of, I can't, of, of coexistence, let's call it, this position of the Myrick is the one that, said that, that sets the tone. This meeting of the minds, this meeting of the communities was the major moment in the major factor affecting Jewish life in Italy is this, this how, 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 are, how are the Yekis and the French and the Italiani going to get along? The Spartan, by the way, they didn't want to play this game. When the Spartan come, when the Spanish Jews come to Italy, they think that they're the, they consider themselves the aristocracy. In one case, they went to Livorno, to Leghorn, and Livorno had never had Jews in there. Had, to the best of my knowledge, never had Jews there before, And they, but they were willing to have the Spartan because the Spartan were well connected, they were merchants and so on, and the Spartan said one condition, and the condition was no Ashkenazim allowed. Right. So. right. Yeah, so, 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 let's, so let's go back more to the story of the Marek. So one, he was in Mantua for, for, for a lot of time, and he had a yeshiva there, and he was also Rehud de Master Leon. Obviously, there's a couple of things to talk about here, and I'll let you discuss this, but obviously there's the uh, the cape. But a little talk about Rehud de Master Leon, I mean, who he was, yes. and how he was very, very important. And the relationship, before we get to the Shashal Kabbalah, I'll give people a... <laughs> we'll get to the Shashal Kabbalah if people know that story. It's, it, it, the truth of the matter is the story of the story of the, of the fight between them led to their possible expulsion from, <clears throat> uh, from Mantua is, is not as important as, as this other issue. Okay. Yehuda ben Yechiel Messerlion was an Italiano, was an Italiano. In other words, he was from the Loazim. He, his ancestry was um, was Italian. Uh, and he was considered to be, at the time, he was an exact contemporary of the Marek, eh, a little bit, maybe a little bit younger. May have he may have lived, like, outlived him by about 10 years. Um, 
he was really the, the preeminent uh, Italian rabbi of the period. An interesting guy. He had his own, he had his own yeshiva. His yeshiva was in the city of Ancona, which is, uh, becomes famous later because of the famous boycott, but this is not, 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 not relevant here. Ancona is a city in the Papal States, which is, sits on, it's a port city on the eastern, on the, on the eastern uh, coast and the central, central part of Italy. Um, he had a, it was a very popular yeshiva. He himself is very, he's a big Talmud Chacham. He has a yeshiva, he gives smicha to a lot of people. Uh, at the same time, he's a doctor. He's a physician. Uh, he's not only just a physician, he's an established physician. Good, he's such a good physician that he is knighted by the German, by the emperor of the German empire. Uh, he's given the title Messer Leon. Leon is like Yehuda, lion, whatever. Messer means sir. Um, sorry, sir, sir Judah. Um, and with that, he was given the right to not only to practice medicine, but to um, uh, certify doctors. Jews at the time were not, there were two major uh, uh, medical schools in Italy at the time, one in Salerno and one in Bologna. However, Jews were not allowed to study there. So basically, if you wanted to be a doctor, so you went to Messalion, you studied under Messalion, you were a... Um, uh, you apprenticed with him, mm -hmm. and when he thought you were ready, he would give you your license, your licencia docendi, or your licencia vacendi. Uh, you know your your license to practice as a uh, as a doctor. Um, we'll come back to that in a sec. In addition, he was um, very much a uh, influenced by the um, humanist uh, humanist uh, um, humanist culture that surrounded uh, Renaissance uh, Italy. He knew Latin cold. He wrote a book, the first Hebrew book published in the life of the author. Uh, it was called Nofet Sufim, in which he uses Cicero and Quintilian, the two great Latin authors, to show how the Bible uh, aligns itself uh, and fits all of the highest standards of, uh, of literature and rhetoric uh, that were known to, uh, known to man at the time. So he, he was interesting, you know, interesting uh, guy. Not many Rosh Yeshiva today uh, were, would be doctors or know Latin or write a book like this. Uh, what's, uh, what's striking about him, however, is um, he was a bit of a kanoi. He's very from. I mean, to the point that even though he was very much the representative of the Italian tradition, even though he was so involved in the outside world, uh, he, he's, he first emerges into the historical stage because of two uh, two ordinances that he wants to publish, both of which would seem to run against the grain of what you would think. You would think these are, you know, like open Orthodox rabbis or something. You know, what? what it, but he, the two ordinances are, one, he wanted to stop people from learning the commentary on the Bible of Ralbag because Ralbag is problematic. Okay, let's say problematic, okay? I mean, if you think Ibn Ezra's problematic, Ralbag is more problematic. So um, that's number one. So you don't think about a guy who knows Quintilian and Cicero uh, as a guy who's going to be a book burner or is going to going to sit there and tell you what you can't read. That's number one. Number two, um, there. If those are, it was, we all know that there is a. Um, we all know that there is a uh, that that in the case of in Lisnida, when there's a uh, when a woman wants to uh, go to mikvah, so when she has a period, so you wait five minutes, wait a minimum of five days, and then if the period is, com is completed, then she has she checks and to make sure that the flow is finished, then you wait seven seven days without any kind of uh, uh, manifestation of any blood, and you go to mikvah. Now, the al pidin there really is no minimum amount of time. You check after one day, two days, whatever it is, you you check, and that's and and that's it. Very early on, um, the idea uh, developed that you should have a minimum of three days, uh, on the grounds that um, if the couple had relations just before just before the onset of the of the woman's period, then it'll take at least three it take three days for the uh, for be able to be able to properly uh, check uh, to see to make to make sure the period was over. Okay. In the 12th century, the Sefer Atruma, who was a student of, um, of uh, Rabbi Ariya Zake, the Rabbi Yitzchak of Don uh, offered that, in fact, we should make it four days. 
Okay. That was a chum. That was considered a chum, right? It was adopted by many Ashkenazim, uh, but it wasn't universally accepted. Uh, the fifth day was is, is a chumrah, is, is, is yet a chumrah, but uh, we're not going to do have to go to that. But so Rav uh, Yudah maybe and the Tanyani didn't accept this minimum. Now, obviously, obviously, you know, if if the, if the woman checked and she saw that there was whatever, that then then then, then you, the, you don't you don't start shepherding a kim. But the point is that that this extra day minimum was a chumrah, and he decided we should that the Tanyani Jews should should add this Ashkenazi chum. Um, there, you get this impression that despite the fact that he was an Italian Rosh Hashiva and he was established in his own right, he was very deferential to Ashkenazing into Italy, because otherwise, why, why mess around with an established uh, Masoret of the Jews of Italy, which is based on, you know, <laughs> hundreds of years of, of, of usage. Um, and, and he was accused of being, you know, of, of, of kowtowing to the, uh, to the Ashkenazim. By the way, it's it, it maybe is it's, it's I think it's indicative as well that that despite the fact that he gave his own son David ben Yehudim uh, ben Yehudim Messer Leon gave him smicha, uh, he decided it wasn't good enough. He sent him to to Padova, to the Ashkenazi um, to the Ashkenazi uh, yeshiva of Rabbi Yudah Mintz that he should really learn Torah there. I you know it's sort of like what shall I say? In the 20s, in the 1920s, you have a lot of, uh, you have this phenomenon of uh, German, good German religious Jews who would study in the Hildesheimer Rabbinical Seminary. But this was this idea, if you really want to learn, you got to go to Tells, you got to go to Mir. That's a similar kind of thing over here. He has his own yeshiva, but oh, but my son's going to go over there. So he, he, this is a very interesting, you know, individual. So he's a doctor. He's knighted. He he writes and writes writes about Latin literature in the Tanakh, and he's very from, typically complex and highly nuanced as a person. Oh. Now he gets knighted around 1469, 1470, by which time Maharik is in Mantova, apparently. Mr. Leon hasn't moved there yet. He's living in Bologna. Uh, around the time he gets knighted, one of the things he gets to do is, as a knight is to wear a specific kind of cape, which is called the kappa. And the way it's described, uh, I have I, the way it's described. It's a it's a long piece of cloth with a hole in the middle, and it flaps back and forth. It's actually uh, and tied or belted uh, in the middle, and if but it flaps at the bottom back and forth. This cape was apparently worn by people who were doctors, and but it was derivative clearly from uh, priestly vestments because all education in Western Europe was ultimately clerical. So, I mean, I like to think about it this way, that one day after, the day after he got um, this position, he walks into Shul for Mincha, he's wearing this thing. And some people in the Shul are not happy. You're wearing a Goyesha thing and da da da. By the way, uh, if you look at the pictures of Rabshan Shemfal Hirsch and some of the uh, Orthodox rabbis in 19th century Germany, and they were all wearing clerical collars, the same thing in the, the chief rabbis of, of England. So you get a sense of how, how, how horrified somebody might have uh, might have been. So they start yelling and screaming. He's screaming at his mother, and everybody's saying, nah, it's Goyesh, it's Goyesh, it's Goyesh. So one of the people living at the time in Bologna was a guy whose name was Shmuel Modena. And Shmuel of Modena was a student of Marik's. So he says, you know what? Let's write to Marik because the Marik, first of all, nobody, no, he doesn't know Latin and he doesn't even know German. Uh, he, uh, he's, you know, he's just the Rav. And, uh, you know, nobody's going to accuse him of being easygoing on all kinds of stuff. And uh, he's one of ours. And uh, let's see what he says. So Messer Leon, um, Messer Leon uh, writes a letter. One of the things we forget is that true, there are two types of chupas. One kind of tshuva is the kind of tshuva they often get in Ramesha, where a balba, a balba so writes a letter, writes a letter, and says, so "What's the answer?" Usually, or more often, um, tshuva responds to our learning correspondence between colleagues, wherein the the colleague, the younger colleague, or the junior colleague, lays out all of his arguments and what he thinks, to, and and the and the and the and the and the meisha doesn't just the respondent doesn't just say. More, you know, it's okay or it's not, he'll respond. It becomes this whole exercise in learning. So apparently, Messer Leon wrote a whole learned disquisition to uh, Mari Cohen why he, uh, why he thinks it's his mother. Unfortunately, that letter has not survived. And he writes back, 
Uh, it's a long discussion. I mean, I really, we don't have time today to go into it. But he goes back and he for the and he sets for all time because his, his opinion was set, but was accepted by the Rama in Shulchan Aruch. He sets for all time the parameters of what is a Jew allowed to do, how, in what ways are Jews allowed to mimic the outside world, and in what ways are Jews not allowed. And basically, he said there is says there are two criteria. Criteria number one: if something is absolutely nuts, it's something irrational and ab and, and, and unquestionably derived, or unquestionably part of pagan of a devotee zara. That's us. That's one. Number two, which is a little bit more flexible, is something which is. Not sneeze. Now, this has got nothing to do with the length of skirts or length of the ladies' your sleeves. In other words, something which is immodest, something which is loud, something which is self-aggrandizing, something which is which which calls attention. It's the it's the opposite of the kind of of anava, the kind of modest personal modesty that, a, that is expected of a Jew. Um, self-effacement, if you want. If it's not one of those things, that's what they're. He also adds. Then when it comes to the kind of self-aggrandizement, he says that's all, and he says even then, it's only us or if you're trying to look, if you're trying to pass like a non-Jew. But if you're you're doing it for other reasons and it doesn't, you're not trying to assimilate, you're not trying to, you know, outdo the outdo the non-Jews, even then it's okay. Then he goes on and he says, therefore, Jews do not have to dress differently than non-Jews under any circumstances. Period. This tshuva is really, really important for many, many, many reasons. Number one, it's at the parameters of chukos akum, uh, of what you're allowed to imitate the, the, the non-Jews on forever and ever because it, it was accepted by the rabbi. Because every good rabbi and every shul and all around the world, when it comes time to Thanksgiving, the question is, are we imitating the non-Jews by celebrating? I haven't thanks to celebrating Thanksgiving so many years, and I, I don't, you know, remember. But, but it, it, can I get? And they all pull out the Marik and they pull out the Ramon. That's 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 where it's known from. Um, but it's more important for more than that because there's a clause to it. First of all, Gra doesn't like this at all. You see, in Shulchan Aruch, he gets very upset. Um, but more importantly. This tshuva is important for an understanding about how Jews often have deep involvement or are deeply affected by Renaissance Italian society and culture. Marik makes it very, very clear that if Jews adopt things that they see on the outside because they want to be part of general society, that's not permitted. If they do it for a positive reason, which is for the uh, for the for the for the benefit of the Jewish community or for Torah, that's all right. Okay, so you might be doing the same thing, but we, but it, but uh, but if you have that that added edge of I want to look like everybody else, that's what apostles it. That's what asters it. Um, but if it's something which is rational, which anybody normal would do, I mean, for example, those who allow, those who permit celebrating Thanksgiving, say, listen, it's not, it's a secular holiday, and we all, the, the and the, uh, the, 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 uh, what's the word, the, uh, the uh, quality of Akar Satov, of, 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 of expressing our thanks to America or to God, whatever, that's all stuff that's, that's, that's internally Jewish, and that's not a problem. That's, that's part of the argument for it. Um, I mention it because this underlying factor is really, really comes up later. In the 19th century, in the 19th century, the czarist government issues edicts, starts with Nicholas I, but uh, continues later, prohibiting traditional Jewish dress and forcing Jews to dress like Westerners. And the Maskilim, who were, you know, really there, they, you know, they were thrilled that this was happening, get the Jews out of the, you know, out of their parochial whatever, and they should dress. Uh, um, the uh, the Maskilim were thrilled, and they found this Maharik. Oh, you see, Jews can dress like everybody else, and there's no problem on whatever. So there's one sub, so, but the problem is they didn't read the whole tshuva, or they didn't didn't want to read the whole tshuva. One of the uh, there's a uh, posek who lived in the late 19th century. His name was Abramza uh, Frankel. Uh, I have I think I have it up here. 
Anyways, should have brought it down. And he says, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? The Marik says that this only works so long as there's a chasm, a psychological or social chasm which separates us from the outside world and we're not trying to pass as non-Jews. But if you're doing something because you want to pass, because you want to look like a non-Jew, even the Marik would have would have prohibited it. Now, I know a lot of the times we you ask the people at Shilas to say so-and-so was Matir, say, yeah, yeah, yeah. But if he lived now, he would he would have uh, so-and-so would have would have prohibited it. In this case, it's absolutely true. And this, this underlying appreciation of the dynamic of influence, how outside influences are accepted or rejected, his delineating that became a major line in terms of um, cultural interaction between Jews and the non-Jewish uh, non society. And it's in the background, if you read the chuvas of, of the Chsam Seifer and the Maram Sheikh, who is even more, more, more <laughs> in terms of all this stuff, he's already set the tone. For these, for all these discussions, would still go on, um, all the way down to, all the way down to the way that Chassidim buttoned their shirts, right? Now, and one last thing on on this before we get to to the alleged quarrel, the uh, the uh, he also the, the, when when the Yudim um, made the Takana on the Nida, the Marik did back him up. Is that correct? The Marik didn't back him up. This is really incredible. Because, because here was where his principled position on every community has the right to um, has the right to to their own traditions. He said, "Look at my community. We have to pass pa him like the safer true. We have to wait four days. But this is how they paskin. This is how they hold." He says, "And they and the Ashkenazi and the Italiani follow the Rambam. The Italiani follow the Rambam, and this is the Rambam Shita. So I can't. What, what right do you have to impose the your humors on them?" Now it's interesting. One of the things that he says something in his tshuva. It's, it's actually it's in it's in Shelot Tshuva the Chadashot Memtet. It wasn't even published in the first edition. He says he says something which is totally was totally misunderstood by historians. He says he says with a pasuk like the Rambam Asher Hu Mehamakilim. He's one of the Mekilim on this issue. What's the minimum? What's the minimum amount of time for a for uh before you before you can make a hapsik tara. Um, so, so Cecil Roth and other historians say, see, Italiani, they really didn't want to be so religious. They wanted to follow Rambam because it was a make -up. No, all that Marik was saying was that happens to be that the Rambam is one of the Mekilim on this. And they follow the, and, and they in general, consistently follow the Rambam. Hello, it's a Gemara and Arabin, you know, how second base Shammai Ose, or base Do you have to be the point is not what's the point of the Gemara and Arabin is is you have to be consistent. Don't don't be an idiot looking for Khumras. And, and that's the question. So and don't look for coolers because that's Rishis. So now there's an alleged quarrel fight. So now the Arab Yud Masadion ends up in Mantua, and the Marik is in Mantua, and the Shashel Sakabal is the only real source we have for this and reliability questions there. So so there's there's a question. I ever wish happened. I I wish I could give you inside information. We we have no idea why it happened. According to the Shoshal Takabala, which is written about 100 years later, Marik and, uh, and Messalion lived in Mantova. In fact, there's a one of, one of the ironies of, uh, of, of Jewish history. There was a very fine, he, he lived a long time, very fine professor, uh, scholar of Italian Jewish history. His name was Vittorio Colorni. Uh, and he checked the, he, he checked the uh, tax rolls and discovered not only did they both live in Mantova, they lived across the street from each other. They lived... <laughs> <laughs> he has this innocent article called um what's it called i'll tell him and i've got it right here um he's got this innocent article called studies of rabbis who lived in bantua and you don't have to you have no idea what's coming when you uh when you uh when you, <laughs> when you take when you, when you look at the article they live across the street from each other by the way the same thing is true with the rivet and the, and the balamor for those of you who are interested but they, they live in this little people little little shtetl and they're both you know yelling and screaming at each other with 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 the, the, the writing conch counter perusian anyways he, he says that they got into a fight and it got to be so bad that the duke just kicked them both out and no idea why no idea why, especially since since basically Myrick had helped um, Myrick had actually helped uh, Mr. Leo. We also don't know if it actually happened. There's no proof that no, we don't know if it happened. We know we, we, what we do know is that not long thereafter, Myrick moved from Mantova to Pavia and stayed there for the rest of his life.
But, you know, given the fact that he was a bit of a stormy personality and we know that he was involved in a couple of de decent controversies and he lost it when it came to Moshe Kapsali. So. Let's mention Kapsali. I think that that, that the interesting part of Mayor Benio in his biography of Leo Kapsali, the noted historian and, and that uh, his nephew. Uh, his nephew does go into this story in depth. Uh, Ramesh Kapsali was, like you said, was the chief rabbi in, in Istanbul when there was Byz Byzantine Jews before the Sephardim really came. I mean, the, the Rabbi Leo Mizrahi was, was a Talmud of his, I believe. And um, he, uh, there was this fight. So, I mean, there was basically, I mean, I'll let you say there was, there was a, a, I guess, a, a Tzedakah collector from Israel that came and that caused the fight. When the, 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 he yeah, Esri, Mr. Um, Moshe Esri of Arba. There's a whole, uh, it, it, this is like, um, you know, it's one of these cases where if there was internet, maybe it, would, no, maybe it was fake. There's a lot of fake news that was involved there. However, however, I, I will say one thing. This is another, this is yet another thing where, another place where Maharik was responsible uh, for changing the face of halacha literally forever. Um, he was the one who um, set the parameters of uh, patterns of psak halacha for Ashkenazi Jewry for all time. Um, because one of the points of contention between, that's the reason I mentioned this, one of the points of contention between, um, between uh, Mahari, ostensible, points of contention between Maharik and Mar Moshe Kapsali uh, was the um, use of the, uh, use of the, um, of the principle of halacha kabasroi, that when you have a machloket of um, of earlier postgame, you always take the later opinion, even though it's uh, goes against the majority or whatever the case might be. And uh, there's a direct line; you can see it straight in the footnotes, or not the footnotes, in the little you know, the parentheses. You see that when the Rama uh, lays out the parameters of um, it's Chosh uh, Mishmet Simon Kafhe of Tavid um, Var Mishnah, the Rama there is all straight is all straight Maharik. The um, it, that, it, that became a point of contention between Ashkenazim and Sephardim later when his response got to Sephardim, got when Maramalshik uh got, got a hold of the Chuvas of Marik and he sees this, he says, How can how is that possible that that one person should be able to be Machria Yachid Kineged But that's uh, that's for the history of Allah. So, so essentially, the story though, just to, the, the, this guy came collecting and he wanted money for uh, the Jews in Israel, but uh, the Turkey Turk was was at war there, and there was so there was he right. didn't want that's why Rameshik Kapsali didn't want to let him collect the money. He got mad right. and he put the whole laundry list of things that the Rameshik Kapsali did wrong. Right, but, but also don't forget there was also but it's more than that. Community in Istanbul, there were at least four communities, and, and some of them liked the rabbi, and some of them didn't like the rabbi. You know, some Mishalok shows up, you're going to listen to him. I mean, you know. Eh. But he comes already with letters from the from from the other members from the other parts of the community from other communities saying, "Oh, this guy is doing this and this and this." I think the the, the beautiful the beautiful part of this is just the uh, the remorse that Marik uh, showed at the end when he realized he'd been had. Said, yeah. Right, right. So, so but in general, look at in general his his is um, his uh, it, 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 it his svarim are. Um, Aside from the first edition of the uh, of the Chuvas, which is still which is still um, which is still in print, um, you have uh, he wrote a parish on Chumash. He wrote a parish. Well, not a parish. His no the notes his sheer notes on Chumash and his sheer notes on the Rambam and his sheer notes on the Smag. By the way, the Sefer Mitzvah Skodel, which is not something that we study on a regular basis, um, was the posek. For French Jews, and as long as the French Jews were a, an identifiable community in Italy, they kept printing it. Um, it was only later that the French Jews ended up assimilating with the Ashkenazim, and there was there was no there was no uh, no 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 reason for it. Um, uh, he gave sheer notes on his sheer notes were published by again by this Pinas yeah, Eliyahu Pinas from uh, Machon Uh I've been asked uh, a number of times to try to organize. Uh, all of his uh, just to it's malachi even chokhmah to write sort of a running parish on the Rambam using just passages you know pa pasting it organizing the material around uh, around the Rambam but it's his his chuvas are 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 amazing and his acuity and his passion um, to read him he's a person who knew he was he wasn't the false anav but he but if you want to get a sense of the burden on the posing. Um, who was called upon to render Das Torah in the in the traditional sense? It's an amazing uh, an amazing experience, and uh, we pay a very high price for not uh, for not learning Chuvis. And very often, even if you're just learning Sugis, and in the case of Myrick, who spends a lot of time 
explaining sugis in uh, in his chubas, it it adds adds dimensions of uh, of of insight that um, are often uh, are often you often miss. Not to mention the fact that he had access to to state versions of the Tosfos and so on that as a French Jew, right? That uh, we don't have anymore. It makes that makes life often makes life a lot easier. Right, so so there's the the Chuvas Mar uh, been reprinted by Oraisa. The Marika Chadashim is by Machon Yerushalayim. Those the Machon Oraisa that put out the Chuvas Marik put out, it was based on a later on a later printing, and you already have some sometimes there's internal censorship. I'll give you an example. The Chuva about um, dressing like everybody else is Chuva Pechet. There are editions of the Marik. Uh, it is one that was published where large sections of the tshuva, there is a Varsha edition. The, the edition that usually people buy, it's not the, it's the one, it's not the price of this one, which is a reprint of the, of the Warsaw edition. It looks like this. Um, in what, yeah, I remember going, I remember uh, I went to the, it was in the library. I pulled it down because I need to look something up and I'm looking. Pay Aleph, pay Bet, pay Gimel, pay Dalet, pay Hey, pay pay Vav, pay Zion, pay Tet. What happened? It's gone. So I, I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. It got, it was removed. It was, it was relocated to the end of the book. In other editions, it's gone. Mom is gone. There, happily now, there's a lot more. Um, there were a lot more manuscripts of his chuvas that were written within his lifetime. In fact, this chuva that I mentioned about the Sivlo note that was sent to Ferenczi, there is a, a, I don't know if it's sold already, there's a uh, an auction house called Ginazim, I think. It just sold. So they recently put up for auction an autograph copy of that chuva with Maharik's notes added. Which I so I've asked them to send me a copy. Uh, they, they promised me a digital copy of this because this is unbelievable. I mean, to see what he wrote afterwards, we just we could change the world. Um, the um, what's important is how. But so I mean, so you know, there's lots of stuff. One of the nicer things, about, I mean, a lot of things happened when when communism disappeared. A lot of at least formally, when communism disappeared in Eastern Europe, one of the nice things that happened was that the um, the uh, a massive collection. Of Hebrew manuscripts in Budapest became available, and now it's been digitized, so that there's a lot more to see. And I mentioned that, yeah, that that manuscript went for two hundred eighty thousand dollars. That was just sold at auction. Yeah, so we didn't get to the famous blood level chuva in Regensburg, and there's many more chuvas, much more. But like you said, uh, you know, time is running out. Uh, one last thing, I'm gonna ask you to finish. And uh, what, when do you know when your uh, when your book will be coming out, or you're just working on it? Uh, yeah, I actually have written. I actually am writing an article about that'll involve that art that chuva about uh, the uh, about the uh, blood libel, which is not which is related indirectly to the uh, Trent uh, blood libel, by the way, um, because the Trent blood libel engendered a whole bunch of other uh, another other ones. It's one of these beautiful cases where Myrick was not just a brilliant Talmud Chacham; he's also a brilliant rhetor rhetorician. Was, he knew exactly how to organize his chuvas so that they would be. That they would be accepted, that they would be they would be persuasive, and one of the things he did was the way he organizes that tshuva. It's Shorish Dalid is the is by he, the rias he picks to show that communities should depend on each other or should help each other are regular normal proofs, but the ones he picked also have. I have to put it uh, sort of like a, 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 a drushy kind of element to it to drive home his point, which is something which is not often, uh, often not often noted. Okay, like you said, there's more to talk about. But do you know when? Do you have any idea when your book is coming out? You're just working on it within a couple of years. Okay, looking forward. All right, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you very much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure.